Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What what a blessing it is that we can gather together, that we can witness to our faith, that we can share in the love and the grace of God on this day. However you may be watching us on this day, wherever you may be, we want you to know that you are welcome here at First United Methodist Church, and we sincerely hope that you feel the grace and the warmth and the love of Jesus Christ on this day. Now, now I do have a, a couple of announcements uh, for us this morning. Uh, if you have not had the chance to yet, I highly encourage you to go and watch the UMK lesson uh, from this past Wednesday. Sean Timmons, our Duke student for this summer, filled in for Miss Bess. Uh, so I hope that you have the opportunity to watch that. And then Miss Bess will be back next Wednesday at 5 uh, with another Miss Bess lesson. Uh, Betsy Beatty's Sunday School lesson is up on the church website or on the church Facebook page and website. I, I hope that you will take some time just to engage with that, to listen to what Miss Betsy has to teach us. Uh, it, it continues to be a wonderful way that our church steps up to make sure that our spiritual needs are being met during this time of quarantine and social distancing. Uh, also, our hot dog meal ministry gave out more than 350 hot dogs uh, again this week. That continues to just be an amazing way that this church is, is reaching out to this community. And, and as we talked about last week, we, we talked about the parable of the sower and the seeds. There are some wonderful seeds being planted here in Cherryville through that hot dog ministry. So I want to thank everyone who continues to volunteer their time and their talents and and donations and their prayers uh, to that ministry because it continues uh, just to be a wonderful way that we are engaging with our community. Uh, now today's a, a special day in the life of our church. Our, our Duke student, Sean Timmons, will be bringing the message for us today. Uh, he'll be preaching for us today. So I, I hope that you stay and, and listen to the word that God has uniquely given Sean on this day. And, and now... I invite you to come together as we seek to worship God in both spirit and in truth. Amen. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, as we come to this time of prayer in our worship service, we're, we're going to begin with a, a moment of silent prayer, then we'll have a spoken prayer, then we'll come together for the Lord's Prayer. Brothers and sisters, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you who have blessedly bestowed free will upon your creation and have given all the freedom through your love, Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of this new day. We give you thanks for your love and your grace which have drawn us back to this time of holy worship. And we pray that through the presence of your Holy Spirit that you would use this time to form us more into the kind of people that you would have us to be. Lord, we confess that far too often we 
take the free will which you have given us and we misuse that freedom that you have so graciously bestowed upon us. More often than not, we seek to serve ourselves and our own selfish desires over and against your will. Forgive us when we stray from your path. Forgive us when we fail to serve others like you have commanded of us. By the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we pray that we may be freed for joyful obedience to your holy will. Almighty God, we, we know that many in your world are suffering right now. Lord, we pray for your healing to be upon all those who have been affected by this COVID-19. God, we, we pray for all those anywhere who suffer. And we pray that all may experience your healing touch. We pray for those who are lost in this community and in your world. Lord, that they might find their way back to you. We pray for all those who have no one else to pray for them on this day. Father, that they might remember in your eyes they are gracious and they are loved. And Lord, we pray that as your church here at First United Methodist, that you would open our eyes to the needs that exist around us in order that we might be equipped and empowered to be in ministry to our neighbors. Here this morning, we lift before you Billy and Bob, Judy and Mike, Janet and Deborah, Vera and Jim, Keith and Ruth, Sherry and John, Ken and Bertha, Ara Ann and Larry, Sue and Carlene, Joe and Chris, Gary and Ron, Earlene and Marty, Sam and Martha, Wanda and Cindy, Miles and Rhett, Lisa and Brandon, Teresa and Dan, Kenneth and Katie, Sherry and the Shrum family, Beverly and Angela, Martha Jane and Ethan, Aaron and Jessica, Cody and all the names and situations that we hold on our hearts. We pray for the leaders of Cherryville, the leaders of Gaston County, the state of North Carolina, the United States and the world. We pray that they may seek your wisdom and your guidance to inform the tough decisions that they are having to make. We pray for all those who love and serve their communities. And we pray that they may be empowered as they seek to love their neighbors. We pray for our soldiers for their safe return and for an end to war. And now, as those who are seeking the freedom which only Jesus Christ can bring us, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, today, guys, I have the honor and the privilege to, to get to bring you a children's sermon. And, and in a little while, Sean, who, who is our Duke student, he's going to be preaching on some parables that Jesus told. And I know you've, you've heard that word parable before. They're these short little stories that Jesus gives to us that, that reveal deeper truths. And today I, I want to focus on, on one of those parables. It's a parable Jesus told, probably one you're familiar with, about a mustard seed. So I, I want to read to you just, just for a second from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. And we're going to be reading, uh, going to be reading verses 31 and 32. Jesus put before them another parable. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. This is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nest in its branches. The smallest of all seeds. Well, I know if I ask y'all to think of something really small, you, you could think of a bunch of things, but, but y'all, I'm, I'm standing here. I've got a plate full of mustard seeds. 
Now, I don't know if you can see those really well or not, but, but trust me, they're tiny. When you get a mustard seed on the end of your finger, I, I've got about 20 mustard seeds on the end of my finger right here. can't hardly see it. In fact, uh, chances are you probably can't see it being as far away as the camera is. They are tiny. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Something so tiny that, that if you weren't looking directly at it, you couldn't even see it. So small, so insignificant, but when it is planted in the right conditions, when it is given the opportunity to grow, not only does it grow to be bigger than a blade of grass, it grows to be a great shrub. So great, in fact, that the birds of the air can come and make their nest in its branches. For me, this parable gives me a lot of hope. A whole lot of hope that, that even the smallest, most insignificant actions that we do towards the kingdom of God, sometimes it could be something as small as giving someone a smile or, or giving someone a hug or just asking someone how they are doing on a particular day. Something that tiny can have the opportunity to reveal the kingdom of God to someone else. Jesus says it's like a mustard seed. Really little. But really little things can become very big things when given the right situation. So this week, as, as you go out and, and, and you go and you talk to friends and you talk to family, I want you to remember that you can sow those mustard seeds. That you can shine the light of God's love. That you can offer someone the glory of the kingdom of heaven just by giving them a small Little actions, small smiles, small conversation, small hug can reveal the kingdom of God. We all pray with me. Good and gracious God, we thank you that you love us enough to invite us to be part of your kingdom and to share your seeds with the world. We pray that you would give us the strength and the power and the foresight to sow those, key, sow those seeds for your kingdom. For it is in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, well now I, I'm going to tell you just, just a little bit about Sean. Some of you may have talked to him on, on the phone over these past few weeks. Uh, it, it's been my pleasure to get to know him over about these past eight weeks. We, we have weekly conversations, and, and Sean is just a phenomenal guy. He's a Baptist, but we won't hold that against him on today. And, and Sean's going to be preaching for us today. So, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Hello everyone, this is Sean Timmons, the rising second year Duke Divinity School student. I am also serving as this summer's church intern. I am excited and honored to be worshiping with you all today. Our gospel reading this morning comes out of Matthew chapter 13 verses 31 through 33 and then skips over to verses 44 through 52. If you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to turn there and to read along. But in either case, I'd encourage you to hear now the words out of the Gospel of Matthew. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. And now skipping down to verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. 
When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous, and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, Yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you will, please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for this day, for another opportunity to serve and worship you. As we prepare our hearts and our minds to dive into your word, to dive into the Gospel of Matthew, we pray that you continue to do a great work within each of us, so that you may then do a great work through us. To our communities. We thank you for Christ, for his life, his death, his resurrection, through the salvation that we have in him. Lord, we pray all these things in his name. Amen. As the summer intern, I have had the joy of getting to work with several of you and call several of you this summer. And you may have gotten the chance to learn a bit more about me through those conversations or perhaps through uh, the videos that I've been making for the church or the Bible study that I, I had the privilege of leading a few weeks back. But I wanted to start this morning by sharing a couple of quick, a couple of brief, fun facts about some of the hobbies that I enjoy doing. Um, so I have several hobbies that I particularly enjoy. Uh, weather permitting, one of my favorites is jogging and cycling. I like them so much that I used to bike several miles to the Duke campus every day for class, even though I have my own car and even though I have a roommate who also has a car and has a parking permit that he used to use all the time. Regardless, I liked to bike. I also really enjoy video games. They often have a bad reputation, but I found they're a great de-stressor after a long day of work. And because of the internet and the ability to join into chat sessions with others, Video games are also a great way to chat with some friends of mine. Out of all my hobbies, however, my favorite has to be, hands down, it's reading. It's amazing. I read all sorts of books, theology and church history, some for school, some for myself, for pleasure reading, of course. Um, but I read other stuff too, devotionals classics, psychological thrillers, you name it. With that being said, I always find myself drawn towards novels, towards books with narratives, with, with stories. There's something unique about getting lost in a good story, especially when it is designed to teach the reader something important. For example, I've recently read Aragon, a story about the dragon riders and the importance of treating all creatures with care, even those radically different from yourself, including the ones with scales, wings, and breathe fire. Just last week, I read Faust, a German classic which follows the main character of the same name as he struggles after selling his soul to the devil. As I'm sure you could guess, the story teaches the importance of not getting attached to worldly matters, lest you fall into the same trap as Faust. Stories are intrinsic to who we are, 
in how we function as people and as people of faith. Jesus knew this extremely well. Hence his regular use of parables when he taught. Jesus spoke longer, more drawn out parables such as the prodigal son or the good Samaritan. He spoke medium length parables such as the story of the sowed seeds as appeared last week in the lectionary and was highlighted in Reverend Zach's sermon. Jesus even shared what I would call elevator parables. Parables that could be told within the span of a ride in an elevator because of how short they were. The parables covered a plethora of subjects, but always seemed to be set in a very ordinary context, with very common issues, many of which we still deal with today, although they may look different than they did in Jesus's time. He used parables so often you could almost hear the frustration in Matthew's voice when he says, without a parable, Jesus told the crowd nothing. This morning, friends, we find ourselves in a privileged position. Our scriptural text is not one, not two, not three, or four, or even five, but six of Jesus's elevator parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's like yeast. It's like treasure hidden in a field, a pearl of great value, and a net. And then we, us, those trained for the kingdom of heaven, are like those who bring what is new and what is old out of treasure. Each parable is short, but all are rich in theological implication. As we read and ponder Jesus's parables found in Matthew 13, I cannot help but notice Jesus's insistence on bringing something new and something old, not just ditching one or the other. Jesus says plainly, according to the New Revised Standard Version, that the kingdom of heaven is like one who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Some have argued that this statement means we are to separate the new from the old, or that there is greater value in one or the other. But this is not so. There is no suggestion that one or the other is better or worse but rather both should be brought out. Furthermore, the New International Version reads out of the storeroom new treasures as well as old. In this translation, it is made clear that both old and new are considered treasure and should be valued as such. For those of us in the church, the message of old and new being treasured is phenomenal news, to say the least. We are this tiny part of an immensely large community that spans thousands upon thousands of years. Because of what is considered old, we are unified with the likes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can confidently read the Psalms, knowing that they still hold value. The words of the psalmist that say, Deal bountifully with your servant, so that I may live and observe your word. Those words still ring true in our worship today, despite being written thousands of years ago. Recognizing the old as treasure allows us to recognize Israel's history as part of our own, and therefore still make it useful for us today. It is this exact logic, the importance of the old, that also tied Jesus back to God's story throughout Israelite and global history, and in which context demonstrates sin and the critical need for Christ's life, death, and resurrection in salvation from sin. Out of all the Gospels, 
Matthew perhaps highlights this arching story of old and new better than any. Matthew naturally follows the story of Jesus, but does so in a way that directly and clearly ties Jesus back to his Jewish roots. Whether it is the Holy Family's escape to Egypt and eventual return out of Egypt, or the over 70, count them, 70 references to the Old Testament relating specifically to Jesus. Matthew is constantly showing Jesus as a continuation of Israel's and God's story. Matthew was skilled at looking at the stories and traditions of old and bringing something new out of them that pointed to Christ. The author of this gospel understood what Jesus meant when he said to bring out the old and the new, and vice versa. Paul, too, saw the importance of recognizing new treasure. It was revealed to Paul that the church is part of the body of Christ, with individual pieces all unique in their own way coming together to make the whole of the church. It was through both old and new in Christ that Paul was able to proclaim to the Romans that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. All of this new treasure brought alongside of the old. Much like Jesus and the entirety of Scripture, we too are summoned to bring the old and the new treasure out of the house of God. Within the scripture, as shown, we have both old and new treasure to dig through and discover. But we are summoned to continue reading, praying, and discovering new pieces of treasure as we bring the gospel of Christ to the world. As history's ever-beating drum presses forward. We are to use the words we have been given to find yet new treasure. The trick to old and new treasure of God, however, is that this treasure rarely, if ever, takes the form we would expect. One commentary notes that the crowd and even the disciples were likely disappointed by the parables Jesus used to describe the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom. Tell us what God's kingdom is like, Jesus. Oh, it's like one of the smallest seeds in all of agriculture. The kingdom of the creator, the maker and sustainer of all the universe is like a treasure buried deep in the ground. It's like a pearl among tons of other pearls. You see, no one would describe the kingdom of God in this manner, except for Jesus. But that is the beauty of God. God doesn't think or act like we would. I serve another church named Hope Valley Baptist in Durham, and I recently held a Bible study with the youth talking about the Good Samaritan. Now, a significant chunk of the study focused on the Samaritan himself, because we often like to think of ourselves as the Good Samaritan. But in reality, the Samaritan is supposed to be the person we would least expect do good. You see, God plays off this unexpected nature all the time. A murderer became one of the greatest missionaries ever. Uneducated fishermen became the top authorities in the early church. Women, who have historically been oppressed, became essential to local congregations as they met 
as they organized, as they sent and received letters, and as they functioned as a whole. The Israelites expected a strong warrior figure to topple the Roman Empire through military strength. They got a savior who died on a cross instead. The parables Jesus tells in Matthew 13 not only bring the kingdom of heaven into a very ordinary context, it makes the kingdom of heaven so plain, so simple, so down to earth, so unexpected, that it's downright scandalous in our And what does Jesus say to do with this? What are we to do with the old treasure of Scripture as well as the new treasure brought about by the revelation of Christ? Friends, I must tell you something that both Reverend Zach and I have expressed throughout this internship. I lament this pandemic. I lament that I am unable to to physically be in Cherryville, getting to know, live with, and serve alongside each of you. For this reason, a part of me feels unable to give a detailed answer to this question, personalized for first UMC Cherryville. Instead, I, I must rely solely on the words, the, the truths of Christ, which is generally for the best. So to ask the question, what are we to do with the old treasure of Scripture, as well as the new treasure brought about by the revelation of Christ? We are to be scribes trained for the kingdom of heaven. The old and new treasures that Jesus has spoken of are to be found right here in God's Word. We have been entrusted with them, but we have been entrusted in a unique way. Rather than librarians who only keep books, Jesus has named us scribes, people who read words but then recount them to others. We, as faithful followers of Christ, regardless of where we are, we are to internalize God's word, our treasure, and bring both the old and the new out of our houses to the world. Just as we are a part of God's grand and marvelous story, God has entrusted us with continuing the story by writing new chapters. So may we grab the treasures God has provided. May we grab our pens and get ready to take part in the greatest story of all. And when the plot takes twists and turns that we ourselves would have never written or even thought of, I pray that each of us asks for the wisdom, the courage, and the humbleness to trust that God can build a grand story out of the most seemingly insignificant and unexpected detail. Perhaps, just maybe, God can use anything, even a mustard seed. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, let us receive the offering.
Almighty God, we return to you a small portion of what you have so richly blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you would take these gifts of our tithes and our offerings and that you would use them how you see fit, that they might be to the benefit of your kingdom and to the glory of your holy name. For it is in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, as those of us who continue to be surprised and astounded by the ways that God breaks into our world, by the ways that Jesus Christ instructs us, I hope that you will go forward this week to share the good news of God's great and redeeming love. For it is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we are sent. Amen.